So this is where the story begins. Newbiggin by the sea, a small seaside fishing village in North Northumberland, uh, known by many. But the story begins here because during the war, um, my uncle Wilf, my mum's oldest brother, uh, signed up for the army illegally before he was old enough. Nobody knows why, but that, there it is. Um, and during active service, he met a girl who came from Newbiggin, and he used to come here on his days off, weeks off, leave, whatever, to stay with her. And he would go back to Leeds and tell everyone about this wonderful seaside village. This is Argyle Terrace in Newbiggin and uh, this is where Wilf met Beatty Johnson, um, his wartime girlfriend. So when he used to come to Newbiggin, this is uh, somewhere in the street anyways where he used to stay. Mum was only 14 during the war and she pestered the life out of her mum and dad my grandparents to uh, come and stay at this seaside village uh, and at 14 during the war I was absolutely amazed that they allowed her to come with a school friend all the way from Leeds to Newbiggin on the train but they did. This is the site that uh, was once occupied by the railway station in Newbiggin which brought all the main traffic holiday traffic in and out of the village. So this is where my mum would have arrived uh, for that two week holiday during the war. Nowadays there's a uh, piece of artwork and memorial here which has a, a suitcase and a, a stone newspaper which says the station closes. The site is now occupied by the medical centre here. But this is the route my mum would have taken off the station platform and uh, towards the beach. So as she came from the station over the road, she would have walked down this path. And uh, back in the 1940s, this had a picket fence along and a very prickly hawthorn hedge overhanging the path. And uh, she would have walked along here on her way to the beach, maybe not knowing that this was the house she was going to buy and live in. So her journey to the beach would have taken her along Aqua Terrace here and then around the corner to the beach. And this would have been a first glimpse of the beach coming through this archway which is known by Newbiggin people as the horseshoe steps simply because of the shape that they used to be back then. And she would have stood and looked at this beautiful little village uh, and all the uh, pleasure that it used to bring to so many people back then when it was a, a thriving tourist attraction. And in front of me here was what they called the middle shelter, which was a, a large uh, concrete building with columns uh, painted white where you could get deck chairs, first aid hut, uh, refreshments. Um, and it was a typical Victorian seaside uh, town offering all sorts to the people who came here on holiday. This is the Hunkleston Rock, which has been repositioned because about five years ago, 
this artificial beach was put back uh, after the original beach was eroded by mining subsidence but back then this beach was extremely flat and you could walk out into the sea for miles and never go any deeper than your knees um, the statue behind me wasn't there and neither were the breakwaters so it had a very very different look to how it does today so having arrived in Newbigin she would have spent much of her time down in the cafe you can see behind me Bertarelli's sold ice cream uh, coffees teas had slot machines and on the beach would have been donkey rides shuggy boats uh, and even you could hire a rowing boat and row out into the bay it was very safe then um, and she spent a marvelous two weeks here uh, I think she even told me she visited Robert Brothers Circus which had come to Ashington the nearby town but at the end of the two weeks she loved it so much she said to a school chum who came with her that this was the place she was going to live one day so she walked along the promenade here up the steps along Aqua Terrace towards the station and then said and this is the house I'm going to live in one day So, Mum left Newbigin that day, jumped on the train and went back to Leeds and it would be nearly 10 years before <coughs> the next stage in her life would bring her a step closer to being in that house. But meanwhile, back in Ashington, this is where my dad lived, number 7, Oakland Terrace. My dad's story actually involves a tragedy which is what brought me mum and dad together and I'm walking on a public footpath here beside a railway line and the front gardens of Oakland Terrace. My dad was a very active young man, he played tennis as a junior at Wimbledon, he was in the Northern Symphonia Orchestra as a violinist, he was an excellent ballroom dancer had a different girl every night I think played football for Ashington when uh, the likes of Bobby and Jackie Charlton and Jackie Milburn were involved with Ashington and uh, very much an active and sporty young man he was very bright too and my grandfather his father paid for him to go to King Edward's uh, private school in Morpeth which was a very expensive private school. Like me, my dad was not so good at sitting exams and he failed the exams. My grandfather wasn't happy and forced him to go down the mines. And my dad didn't want to be a regular pitman, so he decided he would train as a mine manager. And as part of that training, um, he had to spend some time at the coal face um, learning about what happened at the coal face on one particular day the, the roof of the uh, coal seam collapsed trapping my dad under a pile of stone and he was left unsupervised by a mine deputy and shouldn't have been left so because he'd been left uh, unsupervised which was strictly against the rules wasn't entered in the accident book and he was sent home and he was actually suffering with concussion so nothing was recorded in the accident book he was literally sent home and he crossed or tried to cross this railway line to get home and as he did so we think because nobody knows for certain 
he blacked out and as he fell his right arm lay across one rail and both legs lay across the other. He lay there until a coal train coming out of the pit literally the driver wouldn't have been able to see him literally took his limbs off. The amputation brought him to consciousness and he always used to say that he could never, couldn't work out why he wasn't able to stand up. His limbs were still attached but they were severed and he managed with his left arm which was all that was left working to crawl off the embankment across the footpath and up the garden path to knock on the door whereupon my grandmother opened the door to reveal her only son minus his limbs. My grandma was only little and she alerted the neighbour next door and the two of them carried me dad across the railway line to Ashington Hospital which is where the St John's ambulance is today but looked like this back in the 1950s. So they got him into the hospital, got him stabilised. He was a rare blood group, so it wasn't an easy job. They'd had to fight for his life. But having got him stable, they then transported him to Leeds. Would have been a very long journey in those days by road. Leeds Infirmary in the 1950s was still the specialist hospital for amputees, as it had been all through the war. So of course there, they were able to give him the specialist treatment he needed and of course it was there he met me mum she had been a hospital volunteer at that hospital buying newspapers cigarettes posting letters for the servicemen and she'd kept up that voluntary work after the war right into the 1950s so in 1954 she met me dad he persuaded her to marry him and she said on one condition and he said what's that and she said that we live in Newbiggin he said not a problem for me part one of her dream had come true so having agreed to marry my dad uh, he kept his promise after their marriage in September 1954 and he brought her to Newbiggin and this was the first house they bought number 32 Linwood Avenue. Only a couple of years later, I think I was only two, we moved across the street to number 15 Linwood Avenue. And right next door at number 17 Linwood Avenue lived my mum and dad's closest friend, Mary and Colin Ryder, who supported her when she first came here and treat her like family. But this is the back lane where I used to play as a child. Because the accident wasn't recorded, my dad didn't get any compensation. And in any case, compensation claims were rarely honoured in those days anyway. So as far as we're aware, Jackie Milburn and uh, the Charlton brothers organised a charity football match um, between Ashington and Newcastle United to raise money for him. So it's thought that the money that was raised actually paid for the deposit on that house. But what the coal board did do was keep him in a job and he worked as a coal board clerk until he was in his 60s. So having got part one of her dream by coming to live in Newbiggin, she continued to dream about the dream house at Aqua Terrace. So what she would do was put me in the pram because there was no push chairs in those days or buggies and she'd push me along this road uh, to the other end of the village which is about a mile and a half there and back just waiting for one aqua to come up for sale. So finally in 1961 it came up for sale for a princely £2,000. My mum couldn't afford that. Her mum and dad sold their house in Leeds and paid for most of it and she paid the rest off on a mortgage. Of course it didn't look like this back in 1961. It was pretty much run down, it had belonged to two old ladies and over the years my mum spent an absolute fortune on it. I bought it in 2004 when my mum and dad died 
and I spent another fortune on it to make it what it is today.